So, um, good morning. My name is Vitek Yahimchuk. Uh, I manage the computer vision and automated driving teams at the MathWorks. And with me are Anand and Avi. So please introduce yourself, guys. So there are a few of us here. So we can customize the session to whatever you like. So feel free, to, totally free to interrupt at any point in time. If you want to dig into some particular parts more, just shout. Um, so in terms of the agenda, um, well, introduction, and then I'm planning to cover monocular camera sensor. So it's a very popular sensor. And we'll talk about uh, coordinate system setup, uh, distance estimation using monocular camera, and object detection. And uh, later, Anand is going to talk about ground truth labeling. It's a very important task of prepping the data for either training classifiers or for verifying an automated driving system. So we'll talk about, about it in that context. And then after the break, uh, we're planning to to cover deep learning, and that is going to be AVI, and some LiDAR processing, and finish off with tracking sensor fusion and also generating synthetic scenarios in order to, again, uh, validate and verify such designs for tracking and sensor fusion. Okay, so as, as you know, I mean, the race towards uh, autonomous driving is just super fierce, and it's totally amazing that you know, actually these three cars that you see on the screen, you can get a ride in them. So you see a Tesla, you see a BMW 7 Series, and, and an Uber. And actually, very recently, Audi has announced for A8 that they've le reached level three automated driving. So what that means is they're basically saying you do not need to watch the road up to 37 miles an hour. So that's, uh, that's impressive. And in this session, what we're planning to cover uh, mostly is perception. And there are two reasons for it. One, the entire automated driving space, which includes um, lots of techniques, uh, localization, control, planning, and perception, is really vast. And we have limited amount of time over here. Uh, the second reason is that our tools that we've been developing have been actually concentrating at first at perception. So this is a, a beachhead for us. This is a starting point. And it's also a computer vision conference, so it's appropriate. And uh, in terms of perception, uh, we'll talk about vision algorithms, I'll reiterate you know, deep learning, some classical techniques, uh, also a molecular camera system, corn system conversions, uh, and ground truthing, and tracking and sensor fusion. So all of this, again, uh, emphasis on perception and algorithm validation. And throughout the session, what I'll be showing you is a toolbox that we have uh, released in March of 2017, and it's called Automated Driving System Toolbox. So if you want to reproduce what we're about to show you, or you want to learn more, this would be the, the toolbox to get. And we also take advantage of the computer vision toolbox and the neural network toolbox for the deep learning. All right, so the first session, which we, I got marked up from 9 to 9.40, but we started a little earlier, uh, are mainly concentrate on the monocular camera system. And what to expect in those next 40 minutes. Um, so I'll show you, I'll, I'll start by showing you a demo of the system, of what we have put together, and uh, give you an overview. Uh, this is a pretty important sensor. That actually, you find it in most of the cars that are on the road right now. And um, it's produced by manufacturers such as Mobileye or Bosch. Then we'll talk about coordinate systems, mainly transformations between 
the vehicle coordinate system, which is which will be expressed in world units, you know, meters, and uh, and the image coordinate system. And I'll also explain in some detail how you compute the distances from the sensor to the vehicles and other objects in front. And then we'll cover object detectors. And actually, Anand's going, Anand and Avi are going to talk even more about those aspects of uh, automated driving. All right, so before, before I, I get into the demo, let me explain briefly you know, why we've set it up the way we did. So um, in a typical system, what you'll have is a regular camera that basically gathers the video. That data is sent to a small unit that processes that video. And afterwards, um, the found objects, the, the found lane markers, and other information about the processed video gets sent on what's called a CAN bus in a car. And the CAN bus is basically a serial network, so um, it, um, the data on it has to be, be fairly sparse. You cannot just send video around. And the, the typical data that's sent out of unit like this is an object list. So, okay, maybe, you know, vehicle, pedestrian, this description of those objects, and also uh, things like lane markers. So, where are they? What distance from the vehicle? How, uh, and, and their description. So, in the demo, basically, what we'll do is swap that module, say, from um, someone like Mobileye with the processing that we do in MATLAB. So that's the idea. And, and, the, and the demo is going to mimic this type of a setup. All right. So let me actually get to the command prompt and show you the demo in action. You're already seeing some video over here. And also, if there are any questions so far, just please shout. So if you were to try the toolbox, uh, you can uh, open up the, the entire set of examples using the command called uh, driving demos. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. It's the PowerPoint taking over the screen. OK, so uh, as I mentioned uh, just a second ago, uh, you invoke the demos by basically typing driving demos. And now what, what we have on the screen is a list of the demos. Uh, the three at the top are the most um, sophisticated in the toolbox. And there are some below that are more along the lines of tutorials. Um, so we'll start with the uh, visual perception using monocular camera demo. And I'm going to first run it for you. There will be a few displays up front that flash by. They make sense when you read the demo text with explanations. Uh, but let's concentrate on this video. So basically, there are a few things happening over here. On your right, what you see is a bird's eye projection of the video to the left. And actually, I had some, some folks who, who don't do computer vision ask me, you know, how do I get a camera above the, the street, right? So this is just a pure transformation. It's a projective transform. And uh, within the video, we are finding the lane markers, and they can be curved. Uh, we're also locating uh, the vehicles. And the numbers that you see flashing above the detections, those are the distances estimated, uh, estimated by, by, by the code. And let's give it a second. When it stops, you see uh, there's an there's a x value and there's a y value above. The x is uh, in meters to the front of the vehicle. And the y 
points to the left of the vehicle. And all of this is done using monocular camera. Okay, so here you go. Let's see. All right. Let's take a look at, uh, at the code. And then uh, I'll give you an a more thorough explanation of what's going underneath the covers. So with the code, we'll, we'll just do a quick uh, overview and outline of what's inside the demo. And then we'll drill into specifics uh, uh, later on. So the first section basically deals with setting up the, the camera parameters. Uh, so we're providing uh, two things. The camera intrinsics, so the camera setup, and later the camera extrinsic, so how the camera is positioned with respect to the road. And these two items are absolutely necessary for pretty much doing everything else afterwards. And they impact, um, they impact the lane marker detection, the distance estimates, as well as the actual object detectors, surprisingly. Uh, so you see the camera intrinsics over here getting set up. And then by specifying the height of the camera from the ground, you know, how, how high is it mounted, and its pitch, we essentially uh, set up the extrinsics. Uh, once this is configured through this object called monocamera, we're able to do things like um, distance estimates. And uh, the demo, uh, its structure is such that we first grab one video frame and basically walk you through the steps of how to process it. And then we put it all together into um, a for loop and process an entire video. So you see the frame getting red. Uh, we also defined a, a bird's eye projection uh, with uh, basically describing the area that we, that we want to view in front of the vehicle, that we want to transform. Uh, with one line, we can actually transform the image and show it. Afterwards, show it with I am show. Next, and next stage, uh, we go through segmentation and later detection. And this is actually done in bird's eye view. So the, the purpose of going to the bird's eye view is to essentially mm, take out the projective transform. So the lane markers are the same width all along the image. And that just makes the whole process of segmenting and then uh, finding the, the curvature easier. And um, once we have the segmentation, the lane markers are basically found by using RANSAC in this case uh, and uh, fitting a parabola. So this is, this is fairly typical. Actually, uh, a Mobileye 560 unit, which is a commercial unit out there, does, well, I don't know if they use RANSAC, but they, exact, but they do exactly the same thing. They're basically fitting a parabola. Um, they're also, you can also fit a, a cubic, which better approximates a clothoid. Clothoid is, is, the, is the shape, is the, is the type of a shape that's used to design roads and basically, basically makes your driving more pleasurable. Because if, if any turns were done on just a simple radius, as you enter them, you immediately get jerked in your car. But the clothoid makes the process smooth. And so uh, actually a cubic, uh, a cubic polynomial is a good approximation to, to pieces of a clothoid. Uh, later in, later we also, um, classify, classified the, the lane types. So we're trying to figure out whether there are dashed, solid, or double. And this is all mostly done through some heuristics and processing of the data that we have gathered. And uh, in, in the case of this demo, we used 
uh, a vehicle detector based on ACF, so aggregate channel features. So this is what you had seen. But we also have another one uh, based on RCNN, uh, so a deep learning technique. But on this laptop, I don't have a powerful enough GPU, so I'm not showing you that. So that's really the gist of what, what has happened in this demo, or rather the steps, the outline. And um, later on, we show it in the loop. And finally, uh, another video is processed. And this time, all the processing is packaged into a single function. In this case, we call it hel helper mono sensor. And the only thing uh, that, I that I have to adjust, let's say, you know, I, I, I could even replace a sensor, take a different camera, different resolution, different focal length, and so on. The only really thing that I have to do to this code in order to adjust it to that camera is uh, provide the camera intrinsics and extrinsics. And everything else in the code adapts to what's happening. And I'll explain uh, more of that later as we, as we go through, through the sections of the presentation. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. So in your demo, uh, can you exclude the lane markings on the other side of the road? Yes. So in fact, what we do here is only find the ego, ego lane, lane markers. Um, so when we do the segmentation and, and the curve fitting, we, we start by picking out all of them. And afterwards, only concentrate on the two that are next to the vehicle, because that, that does a couple of things. Uh, well, a few things. One is, well, if you wanted to steer the car, you could use that information. Um, second, you, know, you can do things like uh, issue lane departure warnings. Um, and third, you need to know what's in your lane. So basically, if you have a car in front, and maybe it's on the curve, you know, it doesn't look like you're going to hit it. But because the lane markers lead towards it, you can then figure out that you're on a collision course. So, yeah. And, and the, the code uh, can be, it is structured in such a way it's like Lego blocks. You can, you can massage it to, to either pick out all the lane markers or a subset. Uh, what kind of algorithm did I use for picking out the car? Or for detecting the car? The object that gets tracked? Well, there are, um, in this case, we're talking about detecting lane markers, um, but I also, I also did mention a vehicle before. So um, let me. If you missed the, the part where I showed the actual output, then let me play it for you again. Uh, and then maybe I can hear your question one more time. Uh, one sec, sorry. Yes, yeah, so this is the video that I showed. So we're detecting both the vehicles and the lane markers. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. You're chasing the car in the front. Yes. Yes, so um, what is the landmark for that car? Like, how is the car detected? Yeah, how, how did you detect it? It's, the detections are done using uh, ACF, aggregate channel features. It's a technique, it's a classification technique developed by, by Piotr Dollar. OK, so um, let's dive into some of the details. Um, so in order to really understand how to um, do a lot of the, the work, uh, such as um, in particular the distance estimates and also how to uh, understand the entire scene, it, it's critical that, that you understand the coordinate systems. Uh, so this image shows the, the vehicle coordinate system. And to, to some, um, you know, Car engineers, 
This particular orientation is obvious. It actually wasn't so obvious to us, but generally you will anchor the coordinate system somewhere in the car. In this case, it's on, typically it's in the middle of the rear axle. The X for the coordinate system points forward and the Y to the side, just as shown over here. And um, this is actually very convenient. So if you think actually about uh, fitting the lane markers or curvature to the lane markers, the X pointing forward makes it easier because essentially a parabola, uh, this way we, we can arrange in such a way that it's a function. All right. So here is uh, another view now including more elements of the coordinate systems that you have to keep in mind. Um, so that projection from the top that you saw with X and Y, it's present over here as well. So you see the sensor location marked on the uh, XV axis. And the vehicle coordinate system is actually at, at zero, zero point will be somewhere on the rear axle over here, right? And then the two other coordinate systems you have to worry about for the monocular camera system are the actual, is the actual 3D camera coordinate system, and that would be anchored at the focal point of the camera, and the image coordinate system. So just uh, notice that that imaging plane should really be, be, be behind, but this is easier to draw and, and just easier to visualize this way. So all of these uh, are at play, and I'll, you'll hear me talk about them later on but it's really important to, to get this exactly in order to proceed. Okay, so how is the distance measurement actually done with the monocular camera? So a, lot of, a lot of folks think that, that stereo is absolutely necessary for that, but it's not true, actually. Uh, there are some limitations with monocular camera, but um, it can be done quite effectively. Uh, so if you look at that image of the vehicle going on the road, and so, so let's get some intuition first. And you think that you know, it moved further away, that rear bumper, it actually is going to move up in pixels. Right? So clearly it indicates that you know, I can somehow get a measure of the distance from my sensor to that vehicle. And the simplest case is described here to the right. Um, so the, the blue object here, let's say, would be, you don't actually see the mouse. Okay. So the blue object over there uh, would be the lens and behind it, the, say, the CCD. And think about the single ray going straight through the center of the lens. Uh, since I know the height at which the camera was mounted, and I also know the pitch because I set it up, I can actually compute the distance and uh, basic trigonometry. So pretty straightforward. Um, now, that's distance, that distance uh, has to be measured along the flat surface. So that's one assumption that is made with the monocular camera. So if you had a road that pitches up and you detect the vehicle above and you use this computation, you're going to get some error. But generally for the, sh for the shorter distances, it can be pretty accurate. Now, so that, that's for just one beam. And of course, it gets a little bit more complicated when the camera can be mounted in all sorts of positions. Well, how is it really done? Um, the key thing is that you must to obtain the intrinsics. And intrinsics basically so focal length, uh, what's the that the lens introduces, what's the size of the, those would be considered intrinsics. And, and we also establish the vehicle knowing the extrinsics. And that, and the camera position, roughly the camera position with respect to, um, to where you want your zero, zero case on the ground. And together, the intrinsic allow you to 
project the points from the vehicle coordinate system into the And because it's a monocular camera system, basically, um, it's a transformation to the ground, so it's a it's a plane to plane transform. Um, thing I forgot to mention that's pretty important is um, you know if as I mentioned I already mentioned this so the the distance estimates are along along the ground surface, and um, if you want the distance and the location of any point in 3D space. Obviously, this cannot be done. Because if I try to pick some point somewhere on, this, uh, diagonal of, on the diagonal, you know, I wouldn't know what the distance is from, from, from that point to the camera. So I cannot do the computation. So for that, you need stereo. Um, any questions so far? Exactly. So those are the two key things. And I'll also, I also show how to put them together in order to start doing the transformations. Yeah, so the intrinsics, um, they, they consist of um, a few items, like focal length, um, the camera center, um, and a few other parameters. But when they're put together into into a, a, a 3D, I mean, a 3x3 three three projection matrix. Uh, they can be used to basically project uh, data from the camera's 3D coordinate system onto the imaging plane. And the way to get the intrinsics is through the calibration process. So typically, you would um, set up um, some sort of fixture and either hold the camera steady and move the uh, calibration pattern in front of it or vice versa and um, show some known pattern to the camera in order to, to obtain uh, these values. And actually, as part of the computer vision toolbox, we have, uh, we have a very good tool for that. Makes the whole process very easy. And this is just a screenshot of the tool. Now, extrinsics uh, are basically composed of two items. One is the translation uh, from the center of the camera's coordinate system, 3D camera's coordinate system, to the center of the vehicle coordinate system. And the other piece is the rotation matrix. So the rotation matrix basically think about taking the 3D camera coordinate system, and you, you see some alignment of x, y, z. And then on the bottom, you got the vehicle coordinate system. And the idea is that you can ask yourself a question, what, what do I have to do? How do I rotate the camera coordinate system so it aligns with the vehicle coordinate system? And it's your choice where you want to place the vehicle coordinate system. So if you can figure out that rotation matrix, that that's basically together with translation, those are the extrinsics. And, um, but we actually, when we set up the extrinsics in the software, we actually don't ask for the R and T, because that can get really confusing. It's easy to make a mistake in the computation, even though it's not, you know, it's not rocket science, but still you can make mistakes easily. So instead, what the quantities that we request are height, uh, yaw, pitch, and roll of the camera. And that's from, that the yaw pitch and roll is from, from the camera just facing straight forward horizontally, right? So if there's some pitch, you know, say 15 degrees, it, the camera would be basically having an angle of 15 degrees between its uh, optical axis and the horizontal line. Make sense so far? And these quantities, you know, they're, they're much easier to specify. You can actually measure them. Um, that's not a bad way to get them. Even if you say in height, if you make a mistake of one or two millimeters, it probably is not going to make any difference. Because if your tires deflate by that much, you know, you, you're going to have those type of errors present in the system anyway. 
So from these, we can derive R and T. And um, I'm not actually going to go through that because uh, it's a little messy. Um, but if you were to grab the toolbox, um, you can, that, that last bullet, um, all of the code uh, is actually packaged in the mono camera object inside the toolbox. So you can actually edit it and see what the transformations are. And a couple of tips, um, if you were to figure it out yourself, the extrinsics are specified in camera's coordinate system. That's really important to keep in mind. And also, know your 3D rotations. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out how to rotate those coordinate systems, I would suggest you go one ax do rotation by one axis at a time and then combine them. It's just much easier to, to conceptualize that. Um, and it's the case of, uh, if you ever heard that um, skid uh, in Saturday Night Live, uh, Hans and Franz, you know, they say, listen to me now and hear me later. Uh, so um, you know, if you keep this in mind and trying to derive it later on, hopefully uh, th that tip will come in handy. OK, so now that we have the intrinsics and extrinsics, how do we make use of them? Um, so the way, they, the way we can make use of them is basically formulate a projection matrix. Um, so here, the R and T are put together as such. And that essentially formulates a, a matrix in homogeneous coordinate system. That's all there is to it. And then um, it is uh, multiplied by, by k, which are the intrinsics. So let me go back. So what does this mean? It's actually pretty straightforward to look at it in a picture. What that means is basically that we have um, two transformations in a row. So the first transformation will take points that are in the vehicle coordinate system, project and actually um, express them in the camera's coordinate system, and the intrinsics project those points onto the imaging plane. So those are your two steps, essentially. Oops. And um, we can use P, that projection matrix, to go between the image and vehicle coordinate system. And that's expressed in that equation at the bottom. Um, uh, but notice that uh, we also have a Z present. So, so um, a 3D point can be projected into the image plane, no problem. But the reverse is not the case, right? Because for the reverse, if you wanna, if you wanna figure out what point in the image corresponds to some space in 3D in front of the vehicle, for that you need stereo. So in this case, in order to make the matrix invertible, we basically drop the Z um, uh, from the column, from the corresponding column in P, and we take out the the, the big Z um, coordinate, and now we have a three by three projection matrix that we can use to go back between the two coordinate systems. And in terms of code, it looks pretty straightforward. Um, so you see, that first part comes from essentially calibrating the camera, and we're getting uh, intrinsics. Uh, the, height, uh, the height and pitch of the camera are also specified. Those are measured. And by the way, you know, I'll only, talk, I'll only show here pitch, but yo and, um, um, and roll of the camera all, would have also been taken into account, but we're just assuming them to be zero over here. And uh, once the mono camera object is set up, I can start doing the transformations. So here you see basically image to vehicle. So uh, pixel locations in the image, 200, 300, they, uh, they get transformed using image to vehicle to, to the world coordinate system. And because I specified the height in meters, the X and Y coming uh, in, the world, uh, in the world units is going to be in meters. And we also have vehicle to image transform, so the reverse of that as well. And that makes the, you know, all the computations pretty straightforward. It certainly makes it look easy. Um, okay, now 
I also mentioned in the demo that we take advantage of the, uh, the bird's eye view, and mostly for the purpose of doing lane marker detection and then um, you know, fitting the lane markers, basically. Um, and so how do you do it? So actually, it turns out you already know how to do it. If you've been, if you, if you've been uh, you know, listening to what I was saying for the past five minutes, then essentially the transform to uh, vehicle coordinate system is the bird's eye view. Uh, think about it, you know, if I measure something uh, on, the, on the ground, right, express it in units, it's all rect rectilinear. Um, and so the, the last matter that's left is to basically formulate the, um, massage the transform a little bit to, to make it look right for an image. Right, so I need to have certain number of units on a per pixel basis. So there's some scaling, some shifting, to make that um, uh, projection look good. Um, and that image to the right, basically, in the uh, bird's eye projection, we ask for four quantities. So basically, you have the vehicle coordinate system, and we ask for the x min, x max, y min, and y max to specify which area of the um, image you want to see. Now, this is all pointing at the hood of the Porsche, uh, so that's not quite right, but you can imagine, you know, uh, uh, you, you'd be basically grabbing whatever area you want to transform. And in terms of the setup, uh, again, this is also pretty straightforward. Uh, so um, this out view uh, variable that you see in front of you, uh, like in the middle of the screen right now. We actually specified the X min, X max, Y min, and Y max. And uh, the other parameter that I have to ask, ask for is the output image size, because I don't know exactly what you want. Uh, in this case, we ask for uh, 250 pixels in width, and the NAN here is to indicate to automatically compute the height so that um, we preserve the aspect ratio. It's not really exactly the aspect ratio, it's we preserve the number of units on a per pixel basis. So that ratio remains constant uh, horizontally and vertically. Uh, once, the, once the bird's eye uh, view object is configured, I can simply invoke the transform image method on it and get the bird's eye plot. And here's an example of such a projection. And notice that, um, I mean, there's some error, right? The, the lines go out a little bit. Maybe the car pitched at the moment when this was taken. You can, constant, you can compensate for some, some of that too, for the cha changes in pitch if you have, say, the IMU and measure the, the changing pitch of the car. But generally, this projection looks really good. And when we started, uh, we did something na naive uh, where you, know, you can basically draw a trapezoid and then say transform it into rectangle. Yes, that will work, more or less, but it won't give you as good results as properly using the calibration information, the extrinsics to get a very clean bird's eye plot. Any questions? And um, because we use the bird's eye plot uh, or, or bird's eye transformation for lane marker detection, let me mention a little bit about the, about the uh, lane markers. Um, you know, we use a parabolic lane boundary model uh, to fit the, the curves uh, into the segmented data using RANSAC. And uh, we have a, cl a class that stores the information about the lane markers. It also allows you to do projections between the vehicle coordinate system and the image coordinate system. So that comes in very handy. And there are a few functions below that I've listed, mostly for your reference, if you wanted to, uh, to play around with this functionality. Um, and it turns out that this um, camera setup and the, the uh, which we stored in a monocular camera, you know, intrinsic, extrinsic, and so on, they can also have impact on the actual detections. 
or you can take advantage of this information, I should say. So um, we have a function that basically uh, takes three inputs. So the first input over here is a detector that's been trained um, either using ACF, aggregate channel features, or, or a deep learning network. So it's a regular detector that's going to scan the entire image. Uh, sensor corresponds to the, to the mono camera object. So that's the camera setup. And we also give uh, size of the object, a rough size of the object that we're looking for in world units. So um, in case of a vehicle, you know, it'd be I don't know, two and a half meters wide, and, you know, one and a half meters tall, right? And with this information, there are the few things you can do. Uh, so one is because I have all the camera information, I can figure out where the horizon lies. So I can stop scanning the sky, right? And uh, the second thing that I can do is because I have that approximate uh, size of the object, then um, rather than scan the entire scale space in front, I roughly know the sizes of objects that, that I would have in front of the camera, depending on the distance. So that problem is also reduced. So, that, so I get fewer false alarms because I'm not looking at stuff I shouldn't be looking at, like sky. And I do less work because I roughly know what the scale space will be. Uh, so, so, so what did you just, what, what did we talk about? Um, I, sh I talked a little bit about the um, vehicle detection. And as I mentioned, you know, both classical methods, ICF in this case, and, and deep learning, like based on RCNN. Um, we do uh, distance estimation of using the monocular camera and, and have a whole slew of coordinate system transforms, uh, as well as a parabolic uh, lane boundary model. And in order to help with uh, lane boundary detection and processing, uh, we also provide functionality for, for a cl very clean bird's eye projection. Um, and a few things that, that I wanna leave you with, uh, some, some core observations. As you do this type of work, the, the, you know, a few nuggets of, of wisdom after going through all of this, uh, is you know, the, the molecular camera can be pretty powerful. And, it's used, it can be used for distance estimations, for classification, um, and, and actually you know, found in a lot of vehicles nowadays, uh, you know, as opposed to you know, something like stereo. Um, knowing camera calibration is absolutely critical. So if you don't know how to work with camera calibration, uh, but you wanna work in this space, well, you're gonna have to get to know how, how to do some of that work. Um, and also, uh, and this, this is very important, working with the calibrated camera at every stage um, makes the entire workflow much easier and adaptable uh, to new sensors and, and to, to new configurations. Uh, so let's say you know, I have a segmentation routine and if I parameterize it by number of pixels, like let's say some sort of thresholds that involve number of pixels, if I change the sensor, I'm gonna have to go and retweak all those numbers. But if I use the camera calibration configuration, I don't because I can transform whatever I have specified, in this case, in, in the world unit, say uh, millimeters, I can transform it to number of pixels. So by parameterizing everything on world units, the entire process is just much cleaner. Uh, so we actually had a customer that um, uh, has taken um, uh, some of our, uh, has actually tried this monocular camera system in the vehicle, and all they had to do is provide the intrinsic and extrinsics, and right from the get-go, they were able to get uh, pretty decent, uh, you know, lane marker detections. Um, all right, so um, that concludes the, the first section, and now I'm going to uh, 
Well, actually, are there any questions first? Okay, thank you. And I'm going to hand off the microphone to Anand, who's going to talk about the ground truth labeling. Um, for those of you who missed, who missed the introduction, I'm Anand. I work on VTEX team. I focus on automated driving and computer vision. Um, and I'm going to spend the next 30 or so minutes talking about um, ground truth labeling. Um, this is kind of what to expect over the next 30 minutes. Um, we'll start with the motivation for why ground truth labeling is even important topic to discuss in the ADAS uh, automated driving context. Um, then uh, once we get through that, I'll give you a demo of the ground truth labeling interface that's available in MATLAB. Um, and we'll talk about how you can go from you know, tedious manual labeling to accelerating that uh, using automation. Uh, and then we'll uh, talk about a couple of the use cases for what, what you actually do with the ground truth data once you've labeled it. right? So um, let's start with the motivation. Uh, why is ground truth labeling even important, right? Uh, so uh, an ADAS system is made of um, lots of different modules that uh, may be inter-reliant. So um, you have systems that are dependent on each other. Uh, and it's, a, it's for a safety critical application. And so you need golden data in order to be able to verify that your system is doing what it needs to. Um, the example here is of a lane uh, detection system. Um, so for example, uh, a lane detect the performance of your lane detections um, can have a bearing on uh, parts of the ADAS pipeline that come don't have accurate enough lane detections uh, that might Uh, the second use case, uh, most of the perception pipelines are based, rely on classification algorithms or deep learning based algorithms. And all of the training data being available. Uh, and Let's start with what labeling even is. Uh, broadly speaking, um, there's two kinds of uh, labeling you can do. Uh, you have a region of interest, um, a physical location uh, that you would mark up. Uh, so for in a scene over here, uh, you see see traffic signs, you may see pedestrians. So these are uh, bounding boxes, um, region of interest label. You may you uh, road dividers, guardrails, etc. Uh, lane detection systems. Um, or you something a little more complicated, like the drivable path, which is the area of the road, right? The uh, scene label, which is basically, so these could be um, events, maneuvers, or um, uh, lane change events, uh, which can later be used to uh, verify um, these subsystems. They may be weather conditions road conditions or even visibility uh, you would 
want to label for an ADAS system. Right? With that, I'm going to uh, go dive and talk about the ground truth labeler. So the ground truth labeler, um, that's part of the automated driving system toolbox. Basically, do labeling uh, with So you can launch the ground truth labeler using this command or from the apps tab over here. Interface for ground truth labeling. Um, I'll start by talking about how, how, how you would set this up. Um, you'd st you can, so you can see that you can start by loading a so source of data. The source of data could be a video or a sequence of images um, or a custom custom data source. I'm going to start with a video. Sure that um, the video has been loaded. Uh, so you can start by typically when you when you start labeling this, you would go through a um, and you can see that this to um, navigate through these, uh, set up what you want to label. Um, you need to define what are all the kind of labels that you want in your uh, as part of your labeling. And so, uh, you let's say we want to mark up vehicles and. So, so, so when you're setting this problem up, um, it's important to know that you, because you may have uh, a number of people doing the labeling, you want a consistent format, and uh, you want the definition of the labels to be consistent across uh, everyone that's doing the labeling. And so in addition to, the f to just specifying what the label is, um, you can specify a description, which would typically be used to uh, provide instructions for what um, what kind of objects to be labeled. So here you can tie, say something like uh, include, ev include sedans, trucks, et cetera. Um, you can specify what kind, you know, whether you want to include occluded objects or not. And so, so as we set this up, let's say, um, And I'll do one more. I'll do a lane boundary. And in this case, the way to represent a lane boundary would be using polylines instead of a uh, rectangular bounding box. Right. And so th those are the ROI labels. Um, in addition to being able to uh, do region of interest labels that mark, uh, mark physical locations at the sensor sees, um, you want to describe. You want to be able to describe different scene elements. Um, so, for example, let's say weather conditions or visibility. And you typically have a long list over here. Now. You don't want everyone in your labeling team to go over this entire process. And so, um, and you want to be able to maintain consistency across the entire labeling team. So what you would do is, at this point, is save these label definitions. Um, and you, get to you can save them as a mat file, um, uh, which can then be parceled on to, uh, forwarded to everyone on the labeling team so that they have a consistent uh, definition of what needs to be labeled. So now, now, now that all of this is set up, um, let's actually do some labeling, uh, right? So it's easy, as easy as this. You mark up objects. Um, let's say you want to mark up lane boundaries. You can represent that as polyline. And 
and if you have curves in the road, you can, you can increase the frequency of the points that you're marking so that you get more detailed representations. Now, clearly, this is a very tedious process. I mean, I, I just have 25 seconds of video here, and labeling um, a long list of these objects is extremely tedious. Um, and so you don't want to be doing this manually, right? You want any automation that you can leverage. So which is why um, if you look at the algorithm tab over here, I think it's called automate labeling, yep. Uh, you can leverage this in order to speed up your labeling process. And so um, I'm just gonna show you, a there, there's a few built-in labeling, al autom label automation algorithms available. Um, there is a point tracker which uses KLT to basically track bounding boxes across time. Uh, there is an interpolator that works on uh, linear interpolation between points that you mark up. And then there's some uh, vehicle and p pedestrian detectors that you can leverage, right? So I'll just show you um, the point tracker. Uh, I'm going to limit this to a few seconds. Let's say. Let's say this is the vehicle that I want to track. It's as simple as hitting run when I am here, and you'll see the, this vehicle getting tracked throughout. Right? And so what I've done here is immediately gotten about four, five seconds worth of work. So five seconds times, let's say, you're going at 30 frames a second. That's a sizable speed up in your labeling right there. Um, and th this, this tracker is not always going to perform perfectly. You may need to tweak things and review things. Um, and so, but once you're done with that and you accept it, you can see that this vehicle would have been tracked throughout, right? And so that that. That's a, th this is a crucial advantage uh, in, in, in your labeling. You can um, make use of some of these commonly used algorithms to accelerate it. Uh, but if we stop there, that, that wouldn't, just, wouldn't be enough. Um, what you need beyond this is the ability to leverage your own algorithms, because uh, the point tracker using KLT is not the most sophisticated tracker. Uh, you may want something more complicated. And so in, the, in that case, what you can actually do is write your own automation algorithm. Um, and so you can, all you have to do there is um, we give, you have to inherit from a base class whose API we have exposed. And that allows you to write your own automation algorithm. So for example, if you have a better tracker or if, or if you have a better perception pipeline that can be leveraged, you can use that. And um, uh, the, the, instead of having to just follow the API, uh, we provide a template class here that, uh, which is commented and goes step by step. And all you have to do is follow this API, prescribe to this API, and you can uh, write your own algorithm. And so, uh, imagine that you've, you know, once you've done this labeling, um, these labels can then be exported. Uh, they can be exported into a mat file in the form of a, a saved mat file or to the workspace. I, I'll show you that to d talk about a couple of aspects of the uh, data structure that we use here. So you can see that. Um, the exported object uh, is a ground truth object, and that has a couple of different elements that I'll just go over. It basically packs up all the information that's associated with the labeling, uh, the data source, which gives you the source of the uh, video file and the list of timestamps, the label definitions, which um, describes the definition of what you need to label, And so we, we had four, uh, five labels, the vehicle, traffic sign, lane boundary. And you can see that there's three items associated with each of these. It's the name, it's the type, which describes what is used to represent it, and then the description. 
And so this is something that you can actually pass on to a labeling team. And then the um, labels themselves are stored in the form of a timetable data structure. Actually, do this. And this is a very convenient data structure where you know each uh, each column basically represents a different uh, label, um, and these are organized in the time sequence uh, along timestamps that were obtained from the source of data. Um, and so we, we saw that we labeled two vehicles on the first frame. Each of those are represented by a um, uh, M by four array, uh, M by four for X, Y, width, and height. Um, and then the lane boundary, for example, is represented by a set of X, Y points uh, that get stored into a cell array. Um, and then the events themselves, the, the scene labels themselves get represented by Booleans over each uh, frame, right? So the, the other, another crucial aspect of this is being able to verify your labeling. Um, when you're labeling really long sequences of videos or data, um, it's very easy to miss a small thing out. Uh, and so there is a label summary provided, which is a visual depiction of basically a histogram over, all, over the entire video. Uh, it's an easy way to tell whether you've messed something, missed something in your labeling. So you can see um, that. See, this is a better size. You can actually drag this along um, as you move mo as you move between frames. And hold on, just a second. There you go. Oops. There you go. So as we move between frames in the video, you can actually see that um, the all these frames have just one. Uh, vehicle marked up, where, whereas the first few frames have two, which is where we did the tracking. Right. Let me go back to the slides. And so the um, I already talked about a couple of. Uh, Customizations in the app. Uh, we spoke about how you can um, load data from uh, custom data sources. Um, let me just talk about that a little bit more. Uh, there you go. So um, I showed you how you can load data from a video, um, uh, but typ typically a company would ha can have uh, data actually stored in a database or in popular recording formats like a ROS bag. Um, there are lots of these formats out there, and so uh, instead of restricting you to having to use um, a video or a sequence of images, um, you can actually just provide a function handle um, so that you can load data from a custom source of custom source. Uh, I also spoke about how you can write your own custom automation algorithms, and there's an open API. Uh, that you need to prescribe to, uh, and though uh, once you prescribe to that API, the uh, the algorithm just shows up in that list of algorithms. And the the third customization is um, uh, that you can attach a custom visualization tool to this app. Um, so a typical workflow while you're labeling is that just having one sensor is not enough, and so in addition to being able to see the video. Uh, you may want to see a different sensor source or a different visualization to help you labeling. Um, for example, if you have, a, in addition to a camera mounted on the car, if you have LiDAR as well, you can, uh, you can have a point cloud view as a custom visualization tool uh, that's synchronized to um, what the, what, uh, synchronized to the timestamps in the video. And what then happens is that you can use the LiDAR also to help you make me distance measurements or um, other attributes like that. So, 
And so the, uh, the, the interface for attaching a synchronized visualization tool is also open, uh, similar to the automation algorithm. You inherit from a base class and follow a template in order to be able to leverage that. Um, I'm going to show you a small example that uh, has a point cloud viewer uh, attached to. Um, windows around so you can see. Uh, so you, what you have here is a video time and a li LIDAR signal, both of which are time synchronized. And um, we've attached the uh, point cloud player to this, uh, to the ground truth labeler using that API. And what that means is when I play the video here, the point cloud viewer also um, frames in the point cloud viewer also update, and I can go the other way as well. So as I move frames here, the video gets updated. So to um, summarize what we've seen so far, we've seen the ground truth labeler and how you can use that to um, do manual labeling, accelerate that using uh, some of the built-in algorithms that we have, and then further accelerate it using what y your own automation algorithms. Now, um, let, let's talk about a couple of the use cases for what you can do with the, uh, do once you have your uh, ground truth data. Let's start with uh, system level verification and talk about um, uh, evaluating lane detection. This is the basic setup. You have a recorded sensor, some video repository. Um, let's say you use the ground truth labeler and you marked up ground truth data and all of that is stored in the form. Um, and now you the lane, a lane detection algorithm uh, about the uh, mono camera based lane detector that uh, uh, what you get out of that is these which describe the uh, parabola lane boundaries um, evaluate lane boundaries which does a comparison boundary objects that were detected by our algorithm and the ground truth give you some sen a sense of the performance of it's important to have this whole workflow set up um, quickly iterate between uh, and updates or uh, iteration The other thing you can do is actually and use the connector, the visualization tool API to actually measure um, point, uh, pinpoint failures occurring in your algorithms. The second, the second thing you want to do with your true data is train classifiers. Um, once you have ground truth data, um, um, so we've, in order to uh, note that we've we've done labeling on dense. What happens is you're seeing the same object for a number, and so it's crucial to. Um, uh, to prevent overtraining on uh, on the same side. 
and then the, the next step is having to split your validation and test sets where, uh, so that you can get to just train your algorithm, uh, verify up on the validation set, and then uh, move there's a few, uh, a couple of functions that uh, allow you to do this um, that you can look at. And then, of course, uh, there are a number of techniques uh, with training frameworks, object detectors like um, the AC circuit channel features uh, that BTEC showed earlier. Um, Viola Jones based object detector. Then in, in addition to that, there's, there are a couple of deep uh, We have RCNN, uh, fast RCNN, with more in the pipeline. Um, path, you have um, semantic segmentation based training frameworks. Um, so we have SegNet and FCN-based uh, semantic segmentation training capabilities. Uh, and then if you want to do scene uh, or image classification rather than object detection, uh, there's a bag of, uh, bag of features-based uh, uh, classifier as well. So um, let me just summarize a couple of the couple of things that we've learned with our uh, work in um, It's very, so aspects of uh, uh, ADAS, a lot of companies have uh, 100, 200% on actually labeling the data. Um, an easy to use, customizable interface to generate is ground truth data from coming from different signals. The customizability needs to allow you to be able to parts aspects of labeling um, to help you um, make uh, allow uh, make an update to your vehicle detection frame. so that you don't have to go through all that again. The um, observation is that uh, you need a repeatable automated workflow to generate uh, training. Um, once you have all this set up, you can focus on aspects of uh, other aspects of the workflow. Um, if you have any questions right now. If not, I'll hand it over to go for the break. Do the break. Um, after the break, we we'll talk about uh, deep learning and LIDAR and um, I think it's convene at 10.30. Sound good? Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.